People often say that the person you divorce is not the same person you married. When a marriage reaches its breaking point, it typically follows a lengthy journey marked by pain, apathy, betrayal, hurt, addictions, and sometimes even toxic behaviors. Divorce lawyers frequently assert that the affectionate, caring partner you initially wed has long vanished when divorce becomes the only viable option. Despite these challenges, most individuals aspire to move beyond these emotions, aiming for indifference or ideally even friendship. This desire is especially pronounced in cases involving children. It's crucial for both parties to transition from pain to cooperation once all the necessary paperwork is completed, especially if you hope to be a successful co-parent together. However, in a small percentage of cases involving toxic or high-conflict individuals, marriages can turn deadly. The children can be used as pawns to hurt, control, and punish the other parent. And in this case, the institution of marriage had consequences that shattered lives and culminated in tragedy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 12 of the Dark Levity Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberlea, and I'm here with my co-host, my boyfriend, my best friend, and partner in crime, Jonathan. Hi. We're so glad you're here. And don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell so that you don't miss out on our next episode. We'd like to start by introducing you to Tracy Ann Richter. She was born in Chicago in 1966 to a police officer father and a stay-at-home mother. After graduating from high school, she began a nursing program that landed her at the Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. There, the 20-year-old Tracy crossed paths with 30-year-old John Pittman, who was in his fourth year of medical school at Northwestern University. One night while working, he caught a glimpse of a striking woman with thick, dark hair and green eyes who said she was a radiographer at the teaching hospital. He thought she was stunning, even while wearing shapeless hospital scrubs. She told him she was 20 years old, and despite the 10-year age difference, he was struck by her beauty. John had been described as an average-looking guy. What does that exactly mean? Like the average? Average. average. Statistically? He was statistically average, but very hardworking and intelligent, and he made sure to talk to her as often as he could. At first, Tracy, who had more male attention than she knew what to do with, was fairly distant when they crossed paths. Despite her lack of interest, John continued to interact with her as much as he could while they were both working. One particular night, John noticed she was particularly irritable, and she had verbally lashed out at him. This was inappropriate, given the hierarchy in their positions and hospital protocol. He was stunned by her rude behavior and walked away from her mid-outburst. He refused to engage. The next night, she sought him out and apologized for, quote, getting nasty with him. Despite the fact that she was crass and abrasive, John couldn't get past his physical attraction to the young beauty who looked like she belonged in an 80s rock video rolling on top of a car rather than working a hospital But he liked her confidence and her assertiveness. He simply couldn't get past her physical attraction. So he decided to ask her out and let the matter rely on fate. But to his surprise, she accepted and the two went on a double date. She slept with him on the first night. And this coupled with the fact that he found her, quote, quite unsophisticated, end quote, left him questioning the wisdom of his actions. Later, Tracy would deny the two slept together and tell her friends it would be impossible since she still lived with her parents at the time. I guess she wanted to appear more classy. I can't be sure, but I guess this isn't the first time her friends heard her say that. Yeah, and I mean, the timing that that happens isn't exactly a good gauge on whether a woman is worth staying with or classy or not classy. I mean, I personally think waiting and getting to know someone makes it more special and makes the bonds deeper. But, you know, this was also, I mean, this is a little while ago. In this day and age, I don't think it really matters. Despite his mixed feelings, John asked Tracy out again, and they went out a few more times. After their third date, Tracy left him a note telling him that she thought she was falling in love with him. At this point, John didn't feel any depth to their relationship and believed it was more of a physical attraction that he would eventually work out of his system. But Tracy was reeling him in with her body and her flattery. She told him she enjoyed being around a, quote, older intelligent man who was in control and had his act together, end quote. But what Tracy really found attractive was the idea of being a doctor's wife, 
or more specifically, becoming a rich doctor's wife. I was hanging on the words that he thought he could work it out of his system. Right. And I was like, how do you do that? Do you sleep with her a lot? Maybe seeing more of her antics would make him get over her. I was just curious how working it out of his system really worked. But Tracy was a chameleon and everything John was interested in, she found interest in as well. She morphed her personality and her likes and dislikes around what she thought would please him the most. John would say that Tracy had a way of portraying herself as a victim who needed to be rescued. She was a damsel in distress, and she was looking for John to be her knight in shining armor. She actually confessed that she grew up feeling unloved by her cold father, and she yearned for sympathy and victim status. As they continued seeing each other, Tracy would morph and change her personality according to John's praise or criticism. Eventually, John had to leave Chicago for Virginia to complete some of his medical training, and during this time they were apart, Tracy just lavished him with numerous love letters describing her feelings for him and how much she missed him. And eventually, John asked Tracy to join him in Virginia, so she soon followed. John told her to pack her things, and he and a friend would drive to Chicago, pick her up, and bring her back to Virginia. She told John that her parents were against the move, but she was willing to defy them so they could be together. After he arrived, she told him she was having cold feet and didn't want to go anymore or upset her parents. John was embarrassed and he was mystified by her change of heart. He and his friend got a hotel room and the next morning, Tracy called him and said she changed her mind again and now she was ready to go. I mean, she was pretty young. So that's a big decision. I think she might have liked the idea of being with a rich doctor and being his wife. And then when push comes to shove. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty big decision. I think she might have felt a little out of control. And it seems like she likes to be in control. Mm -hmm. So he was surprised when he met her mom, Anna Richter. And she said that she supported Tracy's move and promised she would drive out to Virginia and move Tracy back home if it didn't work out. This was the complete opposite of what Tracy had been telling him. Once she moved with him to Virginia, she immediately changed her mind and told him she wanted to return home. By this time, John was utterly in love with her and willing to do anything to make her stay. This was precisely what Tracy wanted, but she also wanted John to herself. From that day forward, Tracy did everything possible to separate and alienate John from his family and friends. She wanted him hopelessly devoted to her and willing to do anything to keep her. She would threaten to leave often if she didn't get her way. That's just one of the ways she manipulated and controlled the relationship. John's parents owned a condo in Vail, Colorado, and in the spring of 1987, he invited a few friends and couples to join him and Tracy on a ski vacation. It sounded like a great time. Several of the other guy's girlfriends on the trip knew Tracy already. They described her as emotional, erratic, manipulative, and unstable. Tracy was never happy in a situation unless she was in complete control. I knew it. Right? She is a control freak. She would walk out of the room and accuse them of talking about her and plotting against her. She would insult his friends, calling them freeloaders and slobs. Tracy had never skied before and went in feeling disadvantaged, so John hired an instructor to give all the newer skiers lessons the first few days, while he and the more advanced skiers went on challenging runs. But Tracy refused to take the classes. On the third day, John found Tracy crying, saying she felt ignored and rejected by him because she couldn't ski at his level. She told him she felt like the entire group was alienating her. Then she got in a screaming match with one of his friends and he called her a crybaby. This pushed Tracy into a rage and she struck the man across his face, knocking his glasses off and leaving a mark. That's pretty extreme for doing that to someone's friend. Yeah. So John grabbed her and broke up the argument. He was so embarrassed by Tracy's behavior, he offered to ski with her down the easier hills for the next few days to resolve the issue. Once again, Tracy got her way and she effectively alienated him from his friends for the rest of the vacation. Some even left, refusing to spend another night under the same roof as Tracy. There are so many red flags in this entire, just that one trip. You know how they always say, if you want to know if someone's right for you, take them on a trip. For sure. Like be with them for more than a few days and see how they interact with the situation. Yeah, or be sick with somebody. Run for the hills. On the second to the last day of the trip, John decided to go on a few more challenging runs with his remaining friends. When they got back to the condo, Tracy lashed out at everyone for not including her and making her feel useless and unwanted. Eventually, everyone found themselves apologizing to her to keep the peace. But Tracy was still hostile and seething. 
To defuse the situation, John took her out shopping for a condo of their own. John was planning on doing his residency in Colorado, and he planned to bring Tracy along with him. He thought by purchasing real estate, this was a way to calm her down and rescue their vacation. And he was right. It worked. But if you have to go that far... Oh, boy. Not, okay, when they got back to Virginia, according to John, Tracy spent every minute she could placing a wedge between John, his friends, and his parents. John graduated from medical school and moved to the University of Colorado to begin his residency. Despite the fact that his relationship was more down than up, he invited Tracy to move with him. She refused and told him she was going back to Chicago. She said once she got home to Chicago, she would then reevaluate their relationship and decide if she wanted to join him. His parents were elated because they did not like Tracy. She was a lot to deal with. She was needy, she was dramatic, and they were relieved that she was out of their son's life. But John was sad as he was driving Tracy home to Chicago. On the way there, in a moment of spontaneity, he proposed to Tracy and she said yes. John was over the moon. He was about to start his residency in a beautiful new state with a beautiful new wife. He ignored his parents' warnings, and he bought a house and got a dog. But once they moved to Colorado, Tracy began complaining once again. She told him she was lonely because all of the long hours he worked. She told John he was emotionally unavailable to her, and they began to fight constantly. To fill the void, Tracy got several more dogs and two cats. By now, they were married, and Tracy was bored with being a homemaker. Tracy even began scheduling their sex life, and then she would complain that she was too tired from a day filled with doing nothing in order to have sex with him. Tracy was still complaining that he didn't spend enough time with her, and when he was home, she thought that he cared more about the house and the dogs than he cared about her. John decided to keep his wife happy, so he switched from general surgery to plastic surgery. That way, he would have more time with Tracy. Despite shifting his career, John frequently found himself subjected to Tracy's relentless verbal assaults and unfounded accusations of cheating. Tracy was a dirty fighter and would use disparaging and debasing language only to swiftly revert to an air of innocence as if nothing ever happened. But there was one thing that no one knew about Tracy. She was filling her free time with something. She had a side business. But before you think, wow, that's great, she actually was being productive. Wait until you understand the full extent of what her little project was. I can't even believe this. She would seduce married men, and while they were sleeping, she would expose her breasts, take photos of them, and then demand $2,500 to keep the photos from their wives. I have to say that is quite the side hustle, but it's, it's hustling, all right? I mean, I can't even imagine doing that to somebody <laughs> And these guys pretty much had no choice because how would you explain that to your wife? This woman's naked right there with you? I'd call that a booby trap. <laughs> One night in the spring of 1989, John came home to find Tracy balled up in a corner crying. She told him she was pregnant and she was not happy about it. But John was excited and told her maybe this is what they needed to be happy. A family. I can't imagine that being a healthy way to keep a relationship together. If it's already falling apart. But John thought that would give Tracy purpose and make her happy again. But it seemed like it was working. Tracy was consumed for the time being with becoming a mom. Then around the end of Tracy's pregnancy, John's parents had contacted him about a financial matter. Someone had gotten a hold of their credit cards and charged over $15,000 worth of furniture and home accessories to their Vail condo. These items would be delivered to their condo address and then someone would come behind the delivery truck and essentially steal them. Tracy got involved immediately and offered to help figure out the thief's identity. She became the liaison with the police, which surprised Tracy's parents because she usually wanted nothing to do with them. Her dad was a police officer, so hmm. she might have had that in her background and wanted to be involved, but I think it's going to go a different way. Yeah. In February of 1990, Tracy gave birth to Bert Pittman. By April, the police had narrowed down their pool of suspects to two people. One was Tracy's decorator, and the other was Tracy. As I said. Later, when they visited Tracy and John, his parents noticed that many of the stolen items matched the description of items in John and Tracy's home. 
John's parents were livid that their daughter-in-law had stolen from them. They confronted John, but when he asked Tracy about it, she became belligerent and angry. John's parents decided to hire a private detective to prove to John that his wife had stolen from them. The PI came to the same conclusion as the police, but by that time, John couldn't do anything to defend his wife. It caused a rift with his parents that would take years to repair. But from that day forward, Tracy hated his parents and refused to be around them. But she's acting like it's their fault because they're accusing her, but we all know she did it. Yeah. I mean, this is something they investigated. It wasn't a, just a hunch. Tracy also found motherhood very challenging. That's not a surprise. One night, John remembers finding Tracy screaming at their son and shaking him. Tracy uh, wasn't producing enough milk, and she was blaming that on her baby. So John had to intervene. And after that night, he insisted that they switch to baby formula because he felt it was safer for everyone, especially their son. By the next year, John and Tracy's marriage had reached a breaking point. All Tracy did was lash out at him and blame him for everything. Eventually, her screaming sessions became more violent and she would lash out at John and then hit him. She claimed he was neglecting her and working too much on purpose. She was constantly on the edge of flying into an uncontrollable rage. She would scream at him with vile language and insane accusations. After finishing his residency, John decided to work in a lab to reduce his hours once again and give him more time to rescue his failing marriage. During this time, he described Tracy as, quote, vicious and vindictive, end quote. But none of John's changes helped. She would repeatedly physically attack him during arguments and tried her best to get John to strike her back. When he wouldn't, she would degrade him and insult his manhood. But the biggest concern was their finances. Whatever John brought home, it would never be enough. She would outspend him at a rate of four times what he could earn. She bought herself a new car, clothing, jewelry, and anything else she wanted. That's when Tracy offered to get a part-time job to help with the family finances, another side job. <laughs> But somehow, Tracy still managed to spend every penny she made plus more than John could make. After this came the blatant affairs. Tracy was only working 20 hours a week. But despite this, she was never home, and their son was always being raised by the babysitter. Tracy even got herself a brand new pair of breast implants to make her feel better about herself and boost her confidence. Then she began wearing tight clothing, short skirts, a lot of makeup— and her friends described her clothing choice as something a high-class, expensive escort might wear, their words. The last straw came when one of John's friends was visiting. John had gotten called into work, and Tracy asked his friend if he could watch the baby for just 20 minutes while she went to finish something at work. The friend was very uncomfortable with this, and he hesitated. He was from out of town, and he had only been visiting for a few days. But Tracy told him she really wanted to go and finish up some paperwork real fast so she could sleep in the next morning. Even though John's friend didn't want to, he reluctantly agreed to watch the baby. Tracy left at 7 p.m. and didn't return until after midnight. John's friend was livid, and John was embarrassed. That's when he began contemplating divorcing Tracy. It took him that long and that many things. Honestly. But by this time, Tracy was sleeping with several different men and buying them lavish gifts, new skis, and weekend getaways. She was paying for all this on John's credit cards. When John would confront her, she would deny it or say that the cards had been stolen. But John managed to track down one of these men, and he told John that these items were a gift, and he'd been dating Tracy for four months. He didn't realize she was married. Next, John found a canceled check for thousands of dollars worth of sex toys, oils, and condoms. What? Tracy explained she was starting a new business and needed these for inventory. What kind of business? Well, later John found out that she was selling these items to her friends and at strip clubs. John realized that when Tracy accused someone of doing something nefarious, it was all because she was doing it herself. That's when she began accusing John of having affairs. Sounds textbook projection. Yeah, and I also read that she was dating male strippers too. Wow. That's how she became friends with everyone at the strip clubs. On another occasion, John and Tracy got into a fight and he threatened to leave. She pulled out a gun and told him he would never leave this marriage alive. He was disturbed by her behavior and left the residence. Later, a neighbor called because they heard a gunshot. When John returned, there was a gunshot in the ceiling. Tracy told John it was a failed attempt to take her own life but she told the police it was an accidental discharge. 
Around the same time period, Tracy began demanding that John increase his life insurance policy. Unbeknownst to him, she had fraudulently signed an application for additional life insurance. She was unsuccessful. She also asked John if he would prescribe steroids for her uncle. Quote unquote uncle. By this time, John wanted to hire a private investigator to determine what his wife was up to. Every time he accused her of something, she would turn around and accuse him of the same thing. This time he wanted irrefutable proof. That's when John decided to hire the same private investigator his parents did to determine that Tracy had stolen their cards. John's private investigator had already informed him by this time that Tracy had been hanging out with a group of rough-looking bodybuilder types. Her uncle. Her uncle needed steroids. So Tracy asked John to bring home a blank prescription pad. Yeah, she really asked him to do that, and he told her no. He said he could lose his medical license. That definitely wasn't going to happen. Later, she decided to steal his prescription pad and write some prescriptions in the names of various men. It was all around this time that John's PI told him that he was concerned for John's safety and even suggested placing Tracy under full-time surveillance. Within a few days, she had spent the night at one man's apartment and then another two nights at a different man's apartment. When John confronted Tracy with this information, she insisted that those guys were gay and they were just her friends. Sure. She told John she was being followed and was terrified and decided to stay at her friend's houses because she was worried about her personal safety. But John's private investigator had photos of her kissing Several different men holding hands and acting like lovers. The PI prepared a 70-page, yes, a 70-page report that detailed dinners, hotel visits, office buildings she was visiting, and apartments all over the city where Tracy was with various men. The final straw happened when his private investigator called John and told him that he had actually overheard a very disturbing conversation between Tracy and several men. He told him that Tracy was going to try to get him alone at his apartment. He told John that Tracy was hanging out with a criminal element and there was a plan to kill him. John said that he was about to head home at that very moment to meet Tracy and discuss their relationship. The PI said he overheard the entire conversation and Tracy was actually heading in the opposite direction of the apartment. At the same time, she was telling John, to go there because she was waiting for him inside. The PI told John to head to a public place and wait for him to get further instructions. And then the PI went to John's apartment and guess what? He confirmed there were several men waiting for him. When the men told Tracy that John never showed up, she called him and told him, please hurry home. That's when he told her he knew that she wasn't at the apartment waiting for him. That's crazy. Like, what Wild. was she going to have these guys do? Get pumped up on steroids and then, like, beat his ass? Or worse? By this time, Tracy began telling people that John was a drug addict. The PI believed they were going to inject him with illegal narcotics to make his death look like an overdose. Wow, that's even worse. This was the last straw. John was done with Tracy. He moved back to Chicago and moved forward with the divorce. But Tracy wasn't happy losing. John was eager to settle the divorce and move on with his life, but Tracy wasn't going to make that easy. From John's very first visit with his son, Tracy went back to court complaining that John wasn't following the rules, that he was late picking up their son or returning their son. In retaliation, she would deny him visitation. This is when Tracy began her plan to humiliate, annihilate, and destroy John Pittman. She manipulated every situation to maintain control. She would gaslight and shape perceptions to maintain control of the narrative, so John was always the villain and Tracy was the victim. John began to document Bert's condition for his visitation. Bert was often dirty or dressed inappropriately for the weather. He also noticed his son would have welts or bruises in places that indicated abuse. In retaliation, Tracy accused John of inappropriately touching their son. Several of Tracy's friends began contacting John concerned for Bert's safety. Tracy was having sex in front of her son, allegedly viewing adult entertainment, and had a steady stream of men coming in and out of her home. When Bert was asked how he was getting his bruises, he would say his mother was hurting him. Around this same time, John began dating a woman who would later become Bert's stepmother. Bert loved her and would often cry and cling to her when Tracy tried to pick him up. This further enraged Tracy. That's when she planned her counter narrative. She asked John why Bert was showing signs of trauma to his rectum. Tracy brought Child Protective Services into their custody battle and subjected Bert 
to several invasive physical exams. Each time, John was cleared of any wrongdoing. When investigators questioned Bert, they noted that he would look to Tracy before answering. They believe this was a clear sign of coaching. I feel so bad for children who are involved in these kind of battles yeah. and their parents are using them as pawns like this because they're innocent in all of this. And it's just really sad. And they're just like, this is how I'm supposed to live life. And she was actually printing out flyers that said, Dr. John Pittman touches children. It was way worse. She used different words, use your imagination. And she was putting them on cars in the hospital parking lot where he worked. And John eventually took a polygraph and passed it so that he could have visitation with his son again. Tracy and John were finally divorced in 1996, during which John was publicly and officially cleared of any allegations of sexual misconduct. John was granted joint parenting, but Bert would primarily reside with Tracy. And this would be the beginning of their ongoing custody battle. During the same time frame in late 1996, Tracy was on the hunt for several things, a new husband, a new job, and a new way to financially exploit other people. She accomplished two of these things with a dentist and oral surgeon in Chicago. For the sake of keeping this man's name private, we are simply going to refer to him as the dentist. He doesn't deserve to be forever associated with Tracy Richter. By this time, Tracy was using her best assets, I should say her breast assets, her breast implants, to catch the attention of any man that she thought could be of value to her. Both Tracy and her new assets caught the attention of the dentist, who, when asked by her, agreed he could use some extra help around the office setting up a new computer system. He said Tracy could help him on an as-needed basis, since at this time, she was pretending that she was a single mother without any involvement from her son's father. She began by organizing his consent forms and insurance documents, and eventually, she told the dentist he would need a whole new computer system. So... He handed Tracy his business credit card and told her to get whatever she needed. She told him she would need some extra time to go set it up at her house to configure it. It took her months and repeated requests before Tracy eventually brought this computer into the office. And every time Tracy was in the office, she was openly flirting with the dentist and doing her best to seduce him. Eventually, the dentist began taking Tracy out on dates, and they started sleeping together. He was taken aback at the first time she asked him to borrow some money. And it was only a small amount. At first, it was just $200, then $500, and then over 1000 But each time, Tracy always paid him back. So we didn't really see the problem in accommodating her in this way, since he knew she was struggling as a single mother, and she was also pretending not to receive any child support. On another occasion, she asked the dentist to sign some blank pieces of paper so she could scan his signature into the computer. She said this would help streamline their paperwork, including insurance reimbursements and office correspondence. He didn't see a problem with it because there were times where he was in surgery, he couldn't sign important papers, so he agreed. She had him sign with three different size pens in several places on several blank pages. And still, he never found this request odd or a red flag. That's when Tracy got into a car accident totaling her car. She asked the dentist if she could borrow $18,000, explaining she was waiting on the insurance settlement. Obviously, she would pay him right back. She had always been good in the past, and he believed her that this time it would be no different. So he gave her the money, and that's when Tracy began using his business credit card to make fraudulent charges that he didn't approve, one of which was a round-trip ticket to Australia. When the dentist tried to dispute the charges, he was told it wasn't possible since they received a fax from his office with his signature authorizing the purchases. Tracy contacted the dentist a few weeks later and told him she wanted to come in and pay off her loan and return some expensive medical equipment. So the dentist told her to come by at 4, but she showed up at 6. She was surprised to see the office assistant there and told her to leave because she needed to talk to the dentist alone. The assistant would later say that she was dressed to the nines in a revealing outfit that looked like it was chosen for a seduction rather than a loan repayment. She would turn out to be right. Tracy apologized to the dentist for the unauthorized charges and promised to pay him back. That's when she told him about a fantasy she had. She said she wanted to have sex with him while they were both under the use of nitrous oxide. He would later say in the moment of weakness he agreed and took her to the exam room. He inhaled the gas, but she told him he wasn't high enough. She suggested she start an IV with Versed, and he agreed. 
It's a drug given to patients during surgery and makes the patient lethargic. When investigators asked why he allowed her to do this, he said he was thinking with the wrong brain at the time and was expecting to have sex with Tracy. When he woke up and his scrub pants were still double tied, he knew they didn't have sex. But there was also a band-aid on his arm where the IV had been previously. Then the next week, Tracy actually went to Australia to meet a really handsome man by the name of Michael Roberts. He was a few years younger than Tracy, a computer engineer and a devout born-again Christian. He and Tracy had met on an online dating forum for Christian singles. And Tracy thought that his big blue eyes, his dark hair, and of course his Australian accent made him a perfect pick. Tracy told Michael that she was a virgin when she married her first husband and she hadn't had sex with anyone else. She also told him that she didn't believe in premarital sex. And shockingly, and only 18 days later, they were married. While they were still in Australia, she hadn't even come back yet. They got married. But Tracy wasn't finished with the dentist and she wasn't finished with her ex-husband, John Pittman. When she returned to Chicago, awaiting the arrival of her new husband, she sent the dentist a copy of a contractual agreement he had allegedly signed. Remember, she has his signature. She can do whatever she wants with it, and she is. To summarize this document, it stated that they had entered into a contractual agreement with Tracy as a patient of the dentist's office and an occasional independent contractor that worked for him, and that the dentist has admitted that in August 1997, he willfully misrepresented his ability to resolve TMJ pain that Miss Tracy Roberts began to experience. So he promised to fix it, but it was really a fake procedure. He told Tracy it would require becoming consciously sedated, but the dentist secretly intended to remove and replace articles of Tracy's clothing, fondle her breast, and other places down below, take photographs of her and make subliminal suggestions while she was asleep. The agreement went on to say that the dentist stated he had an addictive personality and had a deviant interest in sexual behavior related to pharmaceutical uses in a medical setting. Then the contract described the alleged incident in graphic details where Tracy claimed that she woke up during the surgical procedure to discover that she'd been put in red thigh-high stockings, her underwear had been removed, and she was wearing red stiletto heels that were too small for her feet, and one of her legs was raised up above her head. She went on to allege her breasts were exposed, and the dentist was straddling her with his beep in his hand, and I'm sure you can guess what he was doing. She also alleged that he had taken several Polaroid pictures of the encounter and detailed how she fought back while the dentist cried and begged her not to tell the police. This agreement continued that the two had mutually agreed to enter into this settlement agreement to avoid Tracy bringing public criminal charges against the dentist and risk embarrassment that Tracy would go through if this was exposed. This settlement stated that in lieu of Tracy pressing charges, she agreed that he would pay her a sum of $150,000 replace a two-carat round diamond ring and a three-carat diamond tennis bracelet. And she acknowledged his first payment of $18,000 against the amount owed had already been given to her. Now Tracy didn't have to pay back the loan for her new car, and she got new jewelry that was probably worth a lot of money, and she made a lot of money off this man. That's someone's salary for an entire year and more. The dentist would later tell authorities that he believed Tracy was always several steps ahead of him and had targeted him for an extortion plan when they first met. Tracy never reported this alleged incident, and the dentist never reported the extortion demand, but he also refused to pay her any money. And that is when Tracy tearfully confessed to her brand new husband, Michael Roberts, that she had been attacked and she filed a civil lawsuit against the dentist. She was claiming a lot of things, sexual misconduct, breach of contract, and medical malpractice. 
So now Tracy had a new husband who believed she was a pious evangelical and a beautiful Christian woman who had been violated and was a victim of the men around her who wanted her for their own pleasure. He promised her that he would always protect her. That began with a custody lawsuit filed by her ex-husband, John Pittman. Michael called Tracy's ex, John, and told him he was despicable for being inappropriate with children. He told John he was extremely wealthy, had important friends, and would spend every last penny he had making sure that John would never be allowed to hurt his new stepson again. Tracy would eventually drop the lawsuit against the dentist, but it wouldn't be for a few years, and it would have some odd timing, which we'll get into a little later. At first, Michael was only supposed to move to the United States for six months. He was going to live with Tracy, run his business out of his home office, and bond with his new stepson. Instead, Tracy convinced him to move to a small town called Early, Iowa where Tracy had already researched this idyllic place to raise children. By this time, Tracy and Michael had two children of their own, a son named Noah and a daughter named Mason. Tracy found a realtor by the name of Mona Weedy, and they found a beautiful Victorian home just a few doors down from where Mona lived with her family. Eventually, Michael used Mona again as his realtor to purchase a building next door where he could run it as his IT business. Early Iowa is a quaint town with approximately 500 residents. It's situated at an intersection of two highways. This close-knit community fosters a sense of familiarity and neighborliness, as everyone is acquainted with one another. When Mona first met Tracy and Michael, she thought that they were high-class, well-off, nice people. She loved Michael's Australian accent, and she became one of their first friends in the small town. Mona's real estate business was often slow, so she began working for Michael in the mornings and then doing her real estate business in the afternoons. She wasn't exactly sure what Michael did other than it involved computers and selling computer training. Mona would often share her concerns with Michael about her son, 20-year-old Dustin Weedy. Some called him slow or special needs. It's important to understand Mona and her family dynamic since they're intertwined with Michael and Tracy and they all become very close. Mona and her husband Brett Weedy settled in early Iowa after their marriage in March of 1981. They welcomed their first child, Dustin, who we just told you about, in the late summer of that year. And his arrival was a dream fulfilled for Mona, who always wanted to experience motherhood. With little Dustin in their lives, the Weedy family found a sense of purpose. As Dustin grew and learned, his parents, like most first-time parents, enjoyed watching him blossom into a bright and curious young boy. They marveled at every milestone, from his first steps to his first words. And in 1987, Mona and Brett welcomed a second baby, a little girl named Ashley. Mona was overjoyed. She always wanted a daughter, and she couldn't have been happier. Three years later, Mona gave birth to their third child, Brianna, their family was now complete. Now, moving forward to 1998, when Tracy and Michael moved to early, around this time, Dustin Weedy started to retreat from the world. He found solace in video games, and he often felt excluded, and the virtual world provided an escape from reality where he could immerse himself in adventures and challenges. Despite the virtual friendships he formed, Dustin couldn't shake the feeling of being misunderstood and not liked in the real world. Mona experienced a heart-wrenching moment when Dustin, her precious baby boy, who's now 20, turned to his mother and said, what's wrong with me? The weight of those words broke her heart as she knew deep down that Dustin was perfect the way he was. Her son's unique talents and qualities had always been a source of pride and joy to her. However, she understood that society's expectations and judgments could be harsh, leaving individuals like Dustin questioning their own self-worth. Dustin put on a brave face disguising the pain he felt deep inside. But the truth was, he was ruthlessly bullied at school. Day after day, he endured relentless torment, which made him feel more of an outcast with each passing moment. As the bullying continued, he retreated further from the real world. He would stay in the basement all the time just playing video games. And Mona was particularly alarmed when she discovered that his nickname at school was Freak Boy. Mona recognized her son's anguish, and she was determined to find a solution. She made several trips to various doctors, hoping to uncover the roots of his troubles. Each doctor offered a new diagnosis, leaving Mona feeling confused and overwhelmed. But she refused to give up. In hindsight, Mona believes her son was on the spectrum and gifted. She wanted the school to take him out of special education and move him into a gifted program, but they denied it. She shared with Michael that he had no friends, was often considered defiant, 
and had been diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. If Mona asked him to do a simple task like emptying the dishwasher, it could take him up to three days until he was willing to do it. Michael offered to mentor Dustin, believing all he needed was friendship and Jesus. Michael was hoping to eventually introduce the entire Weedy family to Jesus. This included her husband Brett and her younger daughters. Dustin and Michael did form a strong connection, but it was over paintball, not Jesus. Dustin loved the experience and would often ask his mother when he could go again with Michael and ask her to set it up. On at least one occasion, Michael took Dustin to church with them and then they went to the paintball course afterwards. Mona wasn't so sure that the Roberts were a good influence on her son. She knew that the family was under tremendous stress and Tracy had shared that the father of her older son Bert was being inappropriate and was suing her for full custody. She also had an ongoing lawsuit with the dentist who had sexually violated her. She would often be present when Tracy and Michael argued and it was so ugly it would often turn into screaming matches where she was shocked by the language that Tracy used. Tracy would complain that Michael was controlling and used Jesus as an excuse to control her. Since Tracy and Mona were not very close, since Mona was having reservations about Tracy, Tracy found friendship with another mom in the area, a farmer's wife named Mary Higgins. Mary adored Tracy. She thought that she possessed exceptional qualities. She was beautiful. She was well-educated, kind-hearted, but she was especially a fun person to be around. The bond between them grew rapidly, and they started carpooling their children together to school, and occasionally they would skip their aerobics classes and treat themselves to a daytime glass of wine together to hang out and gossip. And as much as Mary liked Tracy, she did not like her husband, Michael. She thought that he was full of himself. He was always bragging and it was very off-putting. Sometimes Tracy would even tell him not to do that, but he would. Who knows how much Mary actually knew Tracy, but Mona was seeing a different side to her and Mona had her own struggles to deal with. But things started to look up for Dustin. Despite the loneliness that haunted him, Dustin persevered through high school and he graduated in May of 2000. Michael continued to mentor him and try his best to make things in his marriage work. But the truth is, Tracy began having affairs again and Michael was doing his best to save their family. Tracy told Michael that she got a modeling job with an alcohol company, which would often require her to travel out of town and spend the night in hotels. But oddly, there was never any money coming from these modeling jobs. Tracy was very pretty, but no one believed this suburban 30-something mother of three was doing modeling jobs that required her to go travel. We know she likes side hustles. In December of 2000, Michael and Tracy's fights became physical. They would often fight over money, which would send Tracy into a rage. It was looking like John Pittman would get custody of Bert, which meant that his child support would stop. During one particular bad fight in the office while Mona was there working, Tracy stormed inside and started yelling in Michael's face. Michael asked Mona to leave due to Tracy's behavior. Tracy had demanded to see financial records, and Mona was happy to leave to avoid witnessing another argument. According to a police report with Tracy being the one who made these claims, she kicked a wall and damaged some drywall. This allegedly caused Michael to throw Tracy to the ground and hold her there. He called her names and then the fight ended. Later, Tracy called the police and had Michael arrested for the domestic altercation. The early police department confiscated all of Michael's guns, which were later returned to him after things calmed down. Michael's version is slightly different. He said that Tracy was damaging the walls and kicking in the drywall, which was close to an electrical heating unit. There are photos depicting the damage to the drywall. Michael went in and stopped Tracy by wrapping his arms around her until she calmed down. He was concerned she would electrocute herself. They both calmed down and Tracy told Michael she was going back to the house to take a bubble bath. Instead, she called the police and had Michael arrested. While police were present, she had Bert give a statement that he had been reportedly mistreated by his stepfather. This triggered an investigation by Child Protective Services. By law, CPS is required to notify all biological parents of a CPS investigation. This meant John Pittman was notified and could use this information against Tracy in their ongoing custody battle. Tracy had to contact the police again so Bert could clarify his statement to prevent this case from affecting her custody case. In Bert's new statement, he told investigators that it was his biological father who hit him and not his stepfather. Tracy and Bert pretended this was a misunderstanding by the police. Except this doesn't make sense. Why would Tracy call the police against her husband 
for an alleged incident and at the same time have her son give a statement about his biological father mistreating him. This retraction prompted Tracy to make two more false allegations of sexual misconduct against John Pittman. Tracy had a history of coaching Bert's testimony, and this wouldn't be the last time. This was the beginning of Tracy's plan to end John's custody fight and possibly end any future custody battles with Michael. The one thing we know about Tracy is that she plans and she takes no prisoners in the process. Now we're going to fast forward to December 13th, 2001. That evening, Mona went shopping for Christmas gifts trying to get a head start on the holidays, but Mona was unaware of the tragic news that awaited her as she embraced the joyous atmosphere. While Mona was out Christmas shopping, Tracy Roberts was at home. She had a crock pot full of food cooking in the kitchen and was running a bath for her baby girl, Mason. Tracy's older son, Bert, who was 11 at the time, was watching TV in another room with his little brother, Noah. Everything seemed perfectly normal, but at 7 o'clock p.m., 11-year-old Bert placed a call to 911, which was responded by the Sac County Sheriff's Department. The little boy told the dispatcher that his home had been broken into and his mom had been attacked. He said that two men had broken into his home and tied up his mother. They needed help fast. Here's part of that 911 call now. When police arrived, they found 35-year-old Tracy Roberts traumatized and home alone with her three children. As they proceeded upstairs, they saw a man lying in a pool of blood on the Roberts' bedroom floor. In the midst of her shopping expedition, Mona's phone rang, interrupting her festive mood. Word travels fast in a small town. It was her nephew. He was on the other line delivering the devastating news about her friend's home, Tracy and Michael Roberts. Something terrible had occurred, and they were still waiting on news about what happened. Mona rushed home to be there for her friends. Bert relayed what he witnessed to the police. He said he was watching TV when he heard footsteps running towards his door and his mother crying out for help. To his surprise, Tracy rushed towards him, carrying his baby sister in her arms, and she desperately tossed the baby to him. Then he watched in horror as a man grabbed his mother by the hair and brought her into her bedroom, slamming the door behind them. He said he heard his mother call for help in the sound of her being choked. After a while, Bert no longer heard his mother choking and the silence was eerie. He felt a sense of urgency and instinctively grabbed a nearby baseball bat to use it as a weapon. The only thing he wanted to do was protect his family. Bert heard the two men talking and banging on the bedroom door. Their voices were filled with aggression and menace, sending chills down his spine. He said he started yelling and cussing back at them using every bad word he knew. One of the men uttered, shit, she has a gun. Suddenly, gunfire shattered the silence as Bert desperately dialed 911. When the police looked around, they saw one of the assailants lifeless on the floor. It appeared that he suffered gunshot wounds, so they called for both investigators and medical personnel. Tracy was rushed 12 miles away to the hospital. The doctors carefully examined her neck, which had the distressing evidence of ugly red choke marks encircling it. From the hospital bed, Tracy, with a sense of urgency in her voice, recounted the harrowing events that fateful night to the officers as they gathered around her. Tracy told the police that she was home alone with her children because her husband, Michael, was away on business. At the time, she was giving her youngest child, a 22-month-old Mason, a bath, while Bert and her other son watched spy kids in his bedroom. According to Tracy, she heard a noise and she assumed it was her husband coming home early. She walked towards the stairs and she saw two men that she didn't recognize coming up towards her. Tracy's heart began to race as she realized something was wrong. Without wasting a moment, she swiftly made her way towards Bert's bedroom, desperately hoping to protect her children from whatever danger awaited them. In a trembling voice, Tracy revealed that the two men had pursued her relentlessly, their footsteps growing louder and more menacing with each passing second. As she reached Bert's bedroom, her trembling hands barely managing to hold on to the baby, she knew that she had to act quickly to ensure her children's safety. She threw the baby inside Bert's room and told him to lock the door and not come out no matter what. But before she could fully comprehend the situation, the two men seized her, their powerful grip pulling her forcefully into the main bedroom. Tracy recounted how the men attempted to strangle her using a pair of pantyhose she had been drying on the banister. She expressed that she was unable to break free. For a moment, she lost consciousness. Upon waking up, Tracy claimed to have her wrists tied together with the pantyhose now, 
and she heard the sound of men forcefully banging on Bert's bedroom door. While they were caught off guard, she ran to her bedroom where they kept a gun safe. But the men behind her tried to pull her back, but she was able to dive toward the gun safe. It was located in her bedroom next to her bed in a small 18-inch space in between. While fighting the men off, she managed to nervously enter two coats to open the safe, in mid-attack while her hands were tied. All the while, she said she felt the persistent tugging of the men on her feet. And then she pulled out two guns. One in each hand, she used the Beretta 9mm to aim over her shoulder and pulled the trigger. But the safety was on, so nothing happened. Then she tried again, and finally the gun fired, round after round. And she attempted to hit the person behind her. He fell to the ground. The other men ran down the stairs, and she quickly ran to check on her children. But she saw the man on the ground begin to stir, so she swiftly went back into defense mode. With a firm voice, Tracy ordered Bert to return back to the bedroom and call 911. Determined and focused, Tracy approached the intruder, yelling for him to stay down, and fired two more shots with the other gun, the 357 Magnum, making sure he wouldn't come after her or her family. That person who was shot and eventually transported to the medical examiner's office would later be identified as 20-year-old Dustin Weedy. Yeah, unbelievable. What happened here? Around the same time that the officers were headed to Tracy and Michael Roberts' house, Mona arrived to check on her neighbors and ensure that Dustin was okay, since she knew he spent a lot of time with the Roberts family. When Mona arrived, police barricades surrounded the house. But to her dismay, she saw Dustin's car parked in Tracy and Michael's driveway, now surrounded by crime scene tape. Mona's heart sank as she realized something was wrong and it could involve her son. Someone else was worried about Tracy, her mother, Anna, who was supposed to accompany Tracy to Bert's basketball game that night. She was waiting for Tracy to come by and pick her up, but she never came or called. And then her phone rang. It was little Bert. He was crying hysterically. She could hardly understand him, but he was able to tell her that someone was shot and the other man ran out of the house. Anna got in her car and raced over. When she arrived, there were police on the scene. They said she couldn't go inside. It was a crime scene. Anna was yelling for her daughter. They told Tracy's mother to head to the hospital. Meanwhile, back at the hospital, the police informed Tracy that the man that she had shot in self-defense was Dustin Weedy, her friend's son, and her husband's mentee. Tracy's initial reaction upon learning this information was shock and horror. She had no idea that the person that she had defended herself against was someone she knew so closely. In the chaos, she said she couldn't make out her attacker's face. She said that one of them fled and he was about 5'11 to about 6 feet tall with brown or black hair. He was older than Dustin, maybe in his mid to late 30s. A manhunt and full-on investigation was happening in the neighborhood and at Tracy and Michael's home. Whenever there's a homicide, whether in self-defense or otherwise, a homicide investigation must take place. In an interview given three hours later at the hospital, Tracy met with homicide investigator Lieutenant Sessford. Tracy said that her ex-husband John Pittman had abducted her son Bert back in 1992, and she had to go to court to get him back. She told Sessford that in a few days she was supposed to be deposed by John Pittman, and it looked like he would prevail in their custody battle. Lieutenant Sessford tried to steer Tracy back to the events of that night but it appeared she only wanted to discuss her ex-husband. She said she was very young when they married and he was older, controlling, and abusive. She described him as Satan and explained he had been inappropriate with their son and was about to win the custody case against her. Sesford described Tracy as calm, coherent, and uninterested in the whereabouts of her own children. She only wanted to discuss her ex-husband at that moment. Maybe she was in shock. She had been treated for a superficial wound to the front of her neck. She claimed she had been strangled with pantyhose during the attack, and this was the mark left behind. Tracy continued to tell the officer that her ex, John Pittman, was a terrible person and was most likely responsible for what happened to her that night. She said she didn't know how, but she knew he must have been involved. She claimed that Dustin had come to her door earlier in the evening asking for money. She told him she didn't have any and sent him away. She allegedly told him to come back Friday when Michael would be back in town. So now Dustin knew she was home alone without her husband. Tracy was filling in all of the pieces for the police, so all they had to do was follow her breadcrumbs. On the scene, Mona approached the officers with desperation. She anxiously asked them if her son Dustin Weedy was inside Tracy and Michael's home. The officer confirmed her fears and told her that her son had been inside the house. Heartbroken, Mona's voice trembled as she mustered the strength to ask the next question that weighed heavy on her heart. She asked the officer if her son was dead. 
desperately hoping for a different answer. The officer's response was devastating as he slowly uttered the words she feared the most. Yes. Mona was shocked by how callously this information was delivered to her, but her son had just attacked someone, and though it was devastating to her that he would be dead, the officers were worried about the Roberts family and their well-being in that moment. Mona dropped to her knees. She was sobbing. She asked to see her son and just hold him, but that wouldn't be possible. Michael, who was out of state on a business trip, was confused and relieved when he was reunited with his family at the hospital. He could not comprehend why his close friend, Dustin, had turned on him, since the police said it was Dustin who had broken into his home and savagely attacked his wife and children. But of course, he was aware of Dustin's issues from his past. That night, he actually met with Mona, and she apologized for what happened, saying, please tell Tracy I'm sorry, and I love her. Tracy provided the police with detailed information regarding the second intruder. Unfortunately, despite her cooperation, there was a lack of substantial evidence for authorities to pursue. The crime scene technician's investigation yielded no fingerprints, leaving the police with no direct leads. Additionally, no witnesses saw the second intruder fleeing the scene, further complicating this investigation. The defendants found themselves at a loss, struggling to identify this second suspect. As they tirelessly pursued leads and evidence, they delved into understanding the motive behind Dustin's attack on Tracy Roberts. As the days passed, the atmosphere in town was filled with fear. Everyone was on edge due to the presence of a second intruder who was still on the loose. Mary Higgins, Tracy's friend, initially didn't feel the need to lock her doors, but as the fear spread throughout the town, she too started taking precautions. Meanwhile, an autopsy was conducted on Mona's son Dustin, and it turned out he had sustained nine gunshot wounds, three of which were in the back of his head with a 357 Magnum. After the tragic loss of their only son Dustin, Brett and Mona grappled with immense pain and sorrow. They couldn't comprehend how their son had become a subject of accusations being portrayed as an attempted murderer and robber. The very idea of Dustin being a threat to anyone was incomprehensible to them, and they were deeply disgusted by the way he was painted in such a negative light. Sure, he had some behavioral issues in the past, especially as a teen, but he was doing very well as of late. In the wake of their son's untimely death, Brett and Mona would sit together every night, engaging in heartfelt conversations, desperately trying to make sense of what transpired. They were consumed with the overwhelming desire to uncover the truth amidst the chaos and confusion surrounding them. Mona contradicted Tracy's statement. When police interviewed her, she had a very different story. Tracy had told the officers that Dustin was creepy and was making her uncomfortable, especially since she barely knew him. She said it scared her when he showed up at her door, so she sent him away. But Mona told officers the day before the incident that Tracy had called Mona and asked if Dustin could come over the next day to help her with some copies she needed made, and he knew how to use his machines and Michael was out of town. So if Tracy was so afraid of Dustin, why would she invite him over when she knew her husband wouldn't be there? Dustin was only 5'7 and about 155 pounds. His mother told investigators he was extremely smart. He loved computers. It was his dream to study computer science at Iowa State University. He looked up to Michael. Mona said he would never want to harm him or Tracy. Mona told the police that her son wasn't violent and didn't have any friends, so it would have been impossible for Dustin to have committed a home invasion with a second person. She also told investigators that her son had been invited over by Tracy, which is something that Tracy kept denying. It also didn't make sense for him to conduct a home invasion without using a weapon. Even if he were going to do that, why would he park his car in Tracy's driveway? A car that Tracy would have recognized, even if she didn't recognize Dustin. Of course, a mother is going to do what she can to humanize her child, which is understandable. But investigators had a lot to consider. Despite Mona's claims that her son was a gentle soul, Tracy revealed that she never felt comfortable around Dustin when her husband Michael mentored him. Tracy referred to Dustin as being off and expressed her reluctance to have him around her children. She even explained that she was scared because she had witnessed Mona actually complaining about Dustin being rough toward his own sisters. And she even heard Mona crying over this because Dustin had hit his mother in the past as well. Investigators asked Tracy what she thought the motive would be behind Dustin's decision to break into her home and carry out a violent attack against her. One possible reason that crossed her mind was the rare gun collection 
that was owned by her husband, Michael. She speculated that Dustin might have been driven by a desire to obtain these valuable firearms that he knew were inside their home. When police interviewed Michael, he told them what we told you about what Mona had confided in him regarding her son Dustin. His past diagnosis, his issues at school, the fact that he didn't have many friends, and that Michael was doing his best to be there for him. He also shared with the investigators that this was not the first time his attractive wife had been targeted, and he was very concerned for her safety. He recounted how, four years earlier, Tracy had reached out to him urgently. She spoke of the need to fax him and uttered, quote, I hope you still love me after I send you this, end quote. The fax was a typed statement from the Chicago dentist admitting that he had attacked Tracy after sedating her during a dental procedure. The dentist agreed to seek counseling for his sexual obsessions if he, in turn, gave Tracy $100,000 in damages. Michael said that Tracy would keep the incident a secret, and she settled it privately, but he urged his wife to contact police. Michael thought the dentist might have been involved in the deadly home invasion since the case was set for court just days after the attack. However, when the detectives investigated the dentist in Chicago, they could not find any ties to Dustin. And little did they know that Tracy used to be a con artist, and that story was so much different than what she told her husband now. Used to be a con artist? Yeah, really. Mm. Meanwhile, the police made a public statement that Tracy had been cleared of Dustin's shooting and no charges would be held against her. A few days later, Tracy gave an interview to the newspaper, sharing how she heroically saved her family and begged the public for any help in identifying the second man. Tracy would insist to investigators that the key to solving her home invasion could only be found in the discovery of the second attacker. Behind the scenes, the investigation was still going on to bring the second intruder to justice and find out who was behind this attack. Upon further investigation, the detectives discovered a clue that added to the incident's mystery. Inside Dustin's vehicle, they found an old computer that belonged to Tracy and Michael. They wondered when did Dustin have the time to put this computer in his car before Tracy shot him? Had he taken it earlier? Did Tracy know about it? If Dustin were going to steal something of value, there were much more valuable electronics, computers, and jewelry to take, especially, as Tracy mentioned, the gun collection. Also, in the front passenger seat of Dustin's car was a pink spiral notebook. Only the first six pages had been written on, and the notes taken were in Dustin's handwriting. This was confirmed by a handwriting expert who compared it to Dustin's writing samples from his mother. Before we get into the content of this notebook, let's discuss something called holdback evidence. Holdback evidence is information that the police keep a secret during a criminal investigation. They intentionally don't share the details of this evidence to test the credibility of tips or confessions. In some instances, only the killer could know of the existence of the holdback evidence. Police decided to intentionally keep the discovery of this notebook as holdback evidence. And they wanted to keep it secret for one reason and one reason only. They believed it held both the key and the motive to solving this crime. Now let's get into the content of that notebook. As we know, Dustin wasn't found with a weapon, but he was found with a pen in his back pocket. The notebook was written as the start of a journal. It began, quote, One day about 20 years ago, a boy was born into a middle-class life, end quote. Then the journal jumps to several numbered entries. In the first entry, Dustin explains why he decided to start the journal. He says, quote, to make a record of the mysterious fellow who had asked me to work for him. This man is John Pittman, end quote. Well, the police had heard that name before, once from Tracy and also from her husband, Michael. Police assumed this was the reason why Tracy was so fixated on discussing her ex-husband on the night of the attack. She wanted police to make the investigative leap that John Pittman, who was about to win custody of Tracy's son, had hired her neighbor to kill her. Six more lines had strange wording that would take police another 10 years to match. That journal stated that Dustin had been hired by someone with the initials JP to kill someone by the initials TR and her son. It stated that JP was from Williamsburg, Virginia. As a child, he wanted to be a shrink, but his family disapproved, so he went into surgery. Dustin described him as a white male in his 40s with a thing for strippers and hookers. He was slightly overweight and had hired Dustin to torture two victims in their own homes. Those victims were supposed to be Tracy Richter and her oldest 11-year-old son, 
spurt. It ended by saying Dustin was instructed to torture the victims with household items he found inside the home. This would explain why Dustin came over without a weapon. The journal also said that Dustin was supposed to make it appear as though Tracy had killed her son, Bert, and then killed herself. There was also a convenient entry about Tracy and Bert both being killed so that he could collect their life insurance. Upon finding Dr. John Pittman at his home in Virginia, he was informed of what had occurred, and he seemed genuinely shocked. He said he did know of Dustin, but had no personal connection with him. His sister had babysat for Bert in the past, but that was all he knew. The detectives asked local police to check his alibi at the time of the home invasion. It turned out his alibi was airtight. He had been working at a Virginia hospital, but that didn't mean he wasn't able to be behind the attack. He had the means to pay someone to carry it out on his behalf. Tracy called her friend Mary Higgins around this time, saying that John was the prime suspect in the home invasion. He was in a lot of trouble and was going to be arrested. However, weeks passed and no arrest was made and Tracy became frustrated with the police. She would even drive by the station to ensure the lights were on and the detectives were working on the case. When Dr. John Pittman was not arrested, Tracy became bitter and angry with the detectives. She believed her ex wanted her dead because of the custody battle, and she was scared she'd be attacked again. However, the detectives found no evidence linking Dr. Pittman to Dustin. There was no money trail or phone records indicating he had any involvement. As time went on, the detectives shifted their focus to another suspect, Tracy's current husband, Michael. I just have to say, this reminds me so much of another case we did where there was another lady sure and situation. Does. We'll link that in the cards and below because if you are interested in this case, you might be interested in that one. They're very similar but different. So even though Michael claimed to be out of town and out of state on a business trip at the time of the home invasion, the detectives had their suspicions because in cases like this, it's not uncommon for the spouse to be considered the prime suspect. The investigators knew that statistics often pointed to the spouse as the most likely culprit in these kind of situations. And as we know, Mona had witnessed fights between the two of them, and so did Mary Higgins. Mary shed some light on the couple's relationship. She revealed that Tracy and Michael were cold and distant with one another and it indicated a very strained marriage. She further disclosed that Michael would occasionally force Tracy's son, Bert, to leave the house on cold mornings below zero without a coat because he wasn't quick enough to put it on. When detectives looked through arrest records, they found the one we told you about, where Tracy claimed that Michael had jumped on her, attacked her, pulled her hair, forced her head through a section of the drywall. But we know that's not how the story went. But this was the information that the authorities had. 11-year-old Bert revealed in his interview that his stepfather, Michael Roberts, subjected him to physical and psychological trauma. In one incident, he was brutally punished for refusing to clean horse manure with his bare hands and had his nose broken. However, it didn't stop at physical violence. Michael also frequently terrorized Bert psychologically. He explained that his stepfather would humiliate him and employ degrading tactics as punishment. One such method included making Bert drink from a baby bottle whenever he cried during these punishments. Detectives working on the case were puzzled by the possibility that Michael Roberts, who had recently taken Dustin under his wing, playing a father figure role, had actually been grooming him to carry out this crime. Detectives meticulously examined Michael's alibi, searching for any cracks that might expose his involvement. However, they soon realized his alibi was rock solid. There was irrefutable evidence that he couldn't have been the second intruder at the crime scene. As they delved deeper into the investigation, the detectives acknowledged the possibility that Michael could have been the mastermind behind the act, orchestrating everything from behind the scenes. Despite his denial and the strength of his alibi, they couldn't rule out his involvement entirely. It had been almost a year since the case had begun. The detectives were no closer to finding a resolution. Tracy, determined to bring justice, sought Montel Williams' help. Michael had convinced her that taking the case nationally might encourage someone to step forward with valuable information. She wanted to appeal to the public for assistance. As Michael and Tracy stood side by side, they appeared together on the TV show as a cohesive team, ready to do whatever it took to solve the case. She again told her heroic story of how she shot her attacker and saved her children's lives. Tracy was being publicly exalted as a hero. However, Michael and Tracy's marriage was deteriorating behind the scenes. But then, another horrifying tragedy. On Thanksgiving 2002, almost a year from the time of Dustin's death, police got a call about a body lying lifeless in the cemetery. There, they found the body of Dustin's father, Brett Weedy. 
He had his arms draped around his son's headstone, and he had taken his own life. He shot himself right in the heart. The weight of losing his son, his only son, and the rumors surrounding Dustin's demise was too much for Brett to bear. In a letter, he said that his grief had consumed him, and he wanted to be with his son. He cried every day since his son was killed. The echoes from the night of the December 13, 2001 incident had taken yet another life. How devastating for poor Mona, especially the way she was informed. The local funeral director, who she was already in contact with, having to go through everything she did with her son Dustin's death, had called her. And when she picked up, the funeral director said, so you know I have Brett, right? And Mona said, why do you have Brett? And he just blatantly responded with, Brett took his life. And Mona was in shock. Can you even imagine how gut-wrenching that would be? But here's a mom whose son has been accused in a small town of attacking a family. So they were kind of, you know, insensitive, like pointing fingers. Extremely. And only about a month later, despite everything Mona was already going through, Tracy wrote her a letter and accused Mona herself of actually conspiring with her ex, Dr. Pittman, to have her son, Dustin, attack Tracy. And even chastised Mona, calling her a horrible wife to her late husband. Eventually, in April of 2004, Michael Roberts filed for divorce from Tracy. And in response, Tracy took the necessary steps to ensure her safety by filing for an order of protection. She was determined to start over. Tracy made a significant decision and relocated to Omaha, Nebraska in 2004. She then reverted to her maiden name as part of her fresh start. The detectives investigating the home invasion case hoped that the end of this marriage would shed some light on the incident, but no new information surfaced and the case remained cold. Amidst the ongoing turmoil, Dustin's family was plagued with the countless questions that remained unanswered. Mona felt the weight of her fight dissipate without her husband and her son around. Eventually, Dustin's mother and sisters decided to leave their home in Iowa. The painful memories of their life before Dustin's tragic killing and losing their father became too overwhelming for them to bear. They too wanted a fresh start in the neighboring state of Minnesota. Despite the passage of time, Mona, Dustin's mother, remained convinced that there was more to the story in the home invasion than what Tracy Roberts had claimed. She knew her son better than anyone and firmly believed he was not the misfit creep Tracy had portrayed him to be. Dustin was a sweet and loving boy who loved to impersonate Elvis and may have been quiet, but he wasn't violent. She had a lot of questions. If Dustin did go to Tracy's house to kill her, why did he park in her driveway and then enter her home without a weapon? It was hard for Mona to believe that her son stole the junkie computer, brought it to his vehicle, and returned to Tracy's home only to get killed upstairs. Nothing made sense to her. In a conversation with the town's funeral director, Mona learned shocking details about her son's death that led her to believe that Tracy had deliberately misled the police. According to the funeral director, Dustin had been shot three times in his underarm, twice in his hip, and four times in the back of his head. She was overwhelmed by the violence of her son's death. Mona didn't believe that Tracy was acting in self-defense. She believed her son was killed in cold blood. But who would believe her? A home invasion became a cold case until 2008. That's when a state detective and special agent by the name of Trent Villetta became involved in this case, and it consumed him. He thought there was all but a flashing neon sign that this case wasn't a simple home invasion. Mona was left speechless on one fateful Christmas Eve when the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation reached out to her, informing her of a major development in the case of Dustin's untimely demise. It had been seven long years since his tragic death, and the news of a cold case detective being assigned to this home invasion investigation completely shocked Mona. A glimmer of hope began to spark. Finally, there was a chance for justice to be served. But what truly struck Mona was the realization that she wasn't alone in her doubts about Tracy's version of events. Agent Valletta believed that Tracy had gotten away with murder, and Mona felt a sense of validation. Her concerns were no longer dismissed as mere suspicions, but shared by professionals committed to uncovering the truth about what happened to her son. The very first thing that Agent Valletta did was ask the new county prosecutor to take a look at the case. That man was Ben Smith, and he too agreed with Trent that something didn't seem right. 
The first thing the prosecutor Smith did was reread all of the original interviews from 2001. Smith was still hesitant about pursuing the case. He wasn't sure they could prove Valletta's theory and convince a jury of Tracy's guilt. By that time, Tracy and Michael were divorced and in an ongoing custody battle for their two children, which is not surprising because history repeats itself. And Tracy has a track record of always seeking revenge against anyone who she feels has wronged her. By now, Bert was an adult in college, and there was no longer a custody dispute in his case. Prosecutor Smith emailed Tracy to let her know that the cold case unit reopened their case and they were looking into the motives behind her attack. Tracy was thrilled to talk to them and tell them who she believed was responsible. She made sure to tell them that he would never solve the case until they found the second man who escaped that day. The most interesting thing she had to say was who she thought was responsible for her attack. Since she was currently battling Michael Roberts for custody, her story had changed. She believed it was now him that had hired Dustin to kill her and her son, so Michael could go back to Australia with their two children. After Dustin's murder, the whole family went back to Australia for vacation. She told Prosecutor Smith that Michael had only purchased three tickets for himself and his two children. When Tracy and Bert survived the murder attempt, he bought two more tickets. That does sound pretty suspicious. She also told Smith that Michael had taken Dustin to shoot paintballs. They would practice a game called Home Invasion, implying that he trained Dustin to commit the crime. She also changed her story to the second man having worn a mask. She said this despite describing the suspect in her first statement back in 2001. This time, she believed that Michael wasn't really away on a business trip, and he was the second man who came to murder her. Tracy wanted the police to believe that it was a murder for hire and she was spoon feeding them the evidence. I read so many things. There were hundreds of emails that she would send to investigators as soon as they said she, they reopened her case. Yeah. And she also wrote them and said that Michael Roberts was working with Dustin and encouraging him to become a better writer and that he was having him write about being a hitman. And she was like, oh, great. That's a really good idea. We now know that Michael Roberts knew Dustin was violent and he's encouraging him to fantasize about killing people. However, upon closer examination, they noticed several inconsistencies in her account of the basic facts, which raised suspicions about the credibility of her statements. And when they looked deeper into things, they just didn't add up. For instance, the story about the tickets wasn't true. It turned out the credit card statements proved that all five of the tickets to Australia were purchased at the same time. But that's not all. The detectives carefully reviewed the crime scene photos and surprisingly, they didn't see any signs of the house being broken into or ransacked. Instead, it appeared that Dustin simply walked into the house and was shot. There was no evidence of a struggle. Then, detectives began looking through the medical reports. Remember that Tracy claimed she was strangled with a pair of pantyhose, except if she had been strangled hard enough to leave that kind of mark, then she should have also had broken blood vessels in her eyes, which the attending physician noted were suspiciously absent. There were also no signs of pressure on the sides of her neck, just a red abrasion across the front of her neck as if someone had rubbed it raw with something back and forth that was very abrasive. Additionally, medical experts said if Tracy had shot someone the way that she said over her shoulder, she would have blown out her eardrum, but she had no damage to either one of her ears. I'm just thinking like <laughs> two guns. She <laughs> actually had her hands tied and right. she had two guns in her hands and she was leaning this way. Right. And was on her belly. So she was in between, we're going to show you, an 18-inch spot. And she was on her stomach. And she was somehow able to pick both of these guns up and then shoot one like this and hit the person. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But your suspicions are right on. Yeah, in Tracy's version, she said she's shooting the person over her shoulder, the second man who is now masked in yet another version of the story who ran out of the house. She empties the Beretta into the person still coming after her and then goes on and checks for her children. Based on the blood spatter evidence and the fresh blood over coagulated blood, there had to have been at least 15 minutes between the shots to Dustin between the first gun and the second gun. Tracy tells police it was less than a minute after she checked on her children and told Bert to call 911 
that she realized that Dustin was trying to get up and move. At this point, he had been shot in the arm, shoulder, and chest six times. She was in fear for her life that the unarmed young man with a pen in his back pocket was going to attack her again. So standing over him, she shot him three more times in the back of his head with a 357 Magnum. Seems a little overkill. These head wounds were categorized as short wounds, meaning his head had to have already been resting on the floor when the shots were fired. But that didn't make sense with every version of Tracy's story where she said he was a real credible threat to her life. How is that possible with his head on the ground, resting on the floor? This meant he was not trying to get up. Of course, Michael Roberts had a new version of events as well. He and Tracy filed for divorce in 2004, and it wasn't finalized until 2007. They were still in an ongoing custody battle over their children. Again, Tracy followed her old script and did her best to interfere with visitation. She accused Michael of being a terrorist. That's a new one. And being inappropriate with children. Same story. And this one, having an addiction to inappropriate child material. She also said he could hack any computer and plant evidence. In one of Tracy's emails in 2008, she said she thought that Dustin was gay and in hindsight believed that Michael and Dustin were having an affair behind her back. This might explain why Dustin would be willing to kill Tracy and Bert to help him frame John Pittman for the crime so Dustin could be with Michael and she'd be out of the way. If this all sounds confusing and convoluted, it's because I told you there are hundreds of emails. I mean, every month there were several emails to detectives, to the FBI, anyone working on her case, the courts, other countries, like consulates of, it was, wow. it was unimaginable. So that's why there's just so many different stories. And it was like, she was trying to solve the case, giving all these different ideas, which wouldn't be that out of the ordinary if something happened to you and you're trying to have somebody solve your case. But Tracy also mentioned that Michael was good at mimicking different types of handwriting. Oh, that's convenient. It was the first insinuation that Tracy might know about the holdout evidence that she knew of the pink journal's existence. And Prosecutor Smith also discovered that Tracy had altered her final divorce documents. Technically, it was perjury and forgery. The original divorce decree restored her to her maiden name of Tracy Richter. But Tracy had changed her name to what she said was her original name. Are you ready for this? She changed her name to Sophie Karina Therese Baronin von Wrickerhausen Edwards. Wow. <laughs> but to make it simple, she was going by the name Sophie Edwards. She spoke with a fake English accent, had a fake driver's license and passport in this fraudulent name. She also told clients of her house cleaning business that she was happy to be in this new country and adopt all of the American ways. Police also found paperwork for yet another name change, and this one was even weirder. She tried to change her name to Heidi Johanna Forsbaka, which happened to be the name of Michael's new wife. This sounds oh so much like that other story that we did. Oh my goodness. This sounds identical. It appeared that Tracy was getting ready to harass the couple with identity fraud. In 2009, Michael had taken out a protection order against Tracy for her continued harassment. This enraged her and caused her to take out a retaliatory protection order against Michael. It was just back and forth. On March 11, 2009, Tracy called the police and reported that her car had been broken into, and she said that inside, she found a manila-sized envelope with a disturbing photo inside. She had also tried this once before. She claimed that a website was created and that someone had shared a nude photo of her. But it turned out when they researched it, the website was actually created with Michael's credit card and it was a photoshopped picture with her head on someone else's nude body. She had a hearing on her protection order the next day and the officer thought that this was a manipulation tactic to help her with that hearing. And he was most likely correct. He said that the things that she was telling him sounded like a movie and none of it rang true. The photo inside the car that she said was planted there was a photo of the crime scene of Dustin's murder. Tracy handed the deputy a copy of a newspaper article of Dustin's shooting, and she explained that her husband hired this kid 
to go and murder her, and the photo was triggering her self-diagnosed PTSD because she's the victim. Michael's protection order against Tracy was granted, but Tracy's protection order was denied. No one believed anything Tracy had to say. The deputy believed that Tracy had planted the evidence herself. And later, when Tracy was talking to Prosecutor Smith, she told him that this deputy was now on her list. And then she wrote that one day Michael was going to hurt someone. And that quote, I will have the joy of sitting back and saying, I told you so. Wouldn't it be great if you hurt this asshole Lieutenant Gentile's kids? End quote. So she was basically saying she hoped that this deputy who didn't give her the order of protection would get killed. And she then called him a buffoon and a schmuck for not believing her. In May of 2009, Tracy was charged with passport fraud and felony criminal impersonation. When they served a search warrant for her electronic devices, they found some of the most vile and violent material, inappropriately depicting young teen girls being forced into intercourse and then murdered. Tracy would later say that Michael had hacked her computer and planted those horrific pictures there. And it's crazy that she had pictures there that she had looked at in the past. Prosecutor Smith was still surprised that Tracy hadn't been charged for Dustin's murder back in 2001. The events she described were impossible to believe and never matched the evidence. But he knew if he were going to charge her now, he needed to speak with all the old witnesses. He learned two things right away, which was a few days before Dustin's murder. Tracy was going to be deposed in her case against the dentist. When she and Michael were confronted with the evidence that she lied and would be countersued for extortion, she was forced to dismiss the lawsuit. Now Michael would know that his wife was a liar. Right, because everything was starting to come to light. The second thing was that two days after Dustin's murder, Tracy was going to be deposed in the custody case she was expected to lose with John Pittman. This home invasion accomplished two things. It made her a victim again in the eyes of her husband, and two, it delayed the custody hearing. That's the odd timing we talked about in the beginning. So Prosecutor Smith began by interviewing Marie Friedman. On the day of the attack, December 13, 2001, Marie's husband was away on business with Tracy's husband, Michael. So the two women planned to have a sleepover together that night. But Marie thought Tracy must have forgotten because Marie arrived around 4 p.m. And when she got there, she saw another vehicle in the driveway. That was Dustin's car. This was three hours before the attack. Marie brought a tray of cookies And when Tracy didn't answer the door, she let herself in through the side door. Well, Tracy met her at the door and seemed surprised to see her. Tracy explained that she didn't hear her knock because Dustin was at the front door looking for Michael and she sent him away. But Marie didn't hear Dustin arrive or leave or see him at all. Prosecutor Smith thinks that he was probably upstairs taking dictation from Tracy and writing in that pink notebook the same notebook that he believed Tracy planted to stop her custody hearing with John Pittman. Marie said that Tracy told her that she had to cancel the sleepover because she had to go pick up Bert at Storm Lake, but we know that Bert was already home. That's a lie. He was upstairs watching movies with his siblings. Next, Prosecutor Smith and Agent Valletta interviewed Mary Higgins, and this is where they got the piece of evidence they needed to charge Tracy with Dustin's murder. Mary was interviewed by Valletta on behalf of the prosecutor's office. First, Mary told Valletta that she was always uncomfortable with Michael and didn't believe anything he had to say. She thought he had an odd way of articulating his born-again Christian beliefs. When Mary was originally interviewed in 2001, she told the police her loyalty to Tracy wouldn't allow her to share anything that she knew. But now, Mary and Tracy were no longer friends. She told the detectives she was scared of Tracy And if she knew that she was talking to the police, her life would be in danger. She said she never questioned Tracy about the shooting and everything she offered to police was from Tracy herself. That's when the detectives informed her that there was more to this case. And in response, Mary uttered, do you mean that stupid notebook? And the prosecutor's face turned pale. He was lightheaded. He felt faint. Mary should not have known about the journal's existence. No one had ever disclosed that information about the notebook. Wow. In a shocking turn of events, Mary told them that Tracy had confided in her about a top secret journal. 
Tracy had told her back then that she was no longer worried about her custody battle with John Pittman, because the police said he would be arrested soon for hiring Dustin to murder her. Tracy told Mary that the police had found a notebook, and inside it, Dustin confessed to the whole plot and crime to kill her. Tracy also told Mary the contents of what was written in the notebook. She said Dustin had another notebook which was found at his house, which was filled with adult-related photos and personal information about Tracy and Michael. This part wasn't true and was completely fabricated. She assured Mary that John Pittman would be arrested and all her problems would finally be over. She also told Mary that she stood over Dustin and shot him in the head until he stopped moving. One of the more shocking revelations was a conversation Mary overheard between Tracy and Bert. Tracy was telling Mary details about the night Dustin died and Bert said, quote, Mom, why did you have to go back and shoot him? You didn't have to do that. End quote. This statement matched up with the forensic evidence that were at least 15 minutes between the first six shots and the last three with the second gun. Now that they knew that Tracy was aware of the holdback evidence, Prosecutor Smith was ready to prosecute her. In April of 2011, he went to the attorney general's office and asked for help because up until this time, Ben Smith had actually never tried a murder case. Remember, this is a really small town with only 500 people. On July 26, 2011, Tracy was officially charged with the first degree murder of Dustin Weedy. An FBI agent called Tracy and asked her to meet him at a local Starbucks to discuss her case, and she agreed. But first, she did counter surveillance. She was driving around the parking lot several times, making sure she wasn't going to be arrested. As she began driving away, she was pulled over and taken into custody without incident. Bert was in college when Tracy was arrested. He was re-interviewed and asked if his statement in 2001 was correct, and he agreed that it would be the most accurate telling of events. However, his current statement was very different. He was given a lie detector test, which showed deception when he was asked if he had initially been coached. He told officers that his 2001 statement was his version then, and his current statement is his version now, which he said had been reinforced by dreams that he had over the years and from talking to his mother. His dreams helped him clarify a few issues. Wow. Tracy's trial began on October 24th, 2011. At the time of the trial, she had become engaged to a man and he was sitting in the courtroom every day and she would blow kisses to him and say, I love you. For a trial, she was dressed as the sexy librarian type with her hair up, her glasses, her tight-fitting clothing, and of course she pleaded not guilty. The state anticipated the challenging nature of this case. The prosecution began by telling the jury that Tracy had staged a home invasion as part of an elaborate scheme to frame her ex-husband, Dr. John Pittman, and to carry out her plan, she lured Dustin over to her house as a pawn in order to avoid her custody battle. Dustin was found with a pen in his back pocket. The ink matched the ink on that six-page journal. He told the jury how the writing in the notebook described John Pittman as a man who always wanted to be a psychiatrist, but his family wouldn't allow it, that he got physical with his wife and he liked to tie her up and gag her. The prosecutor saw these exact same phrases in a deposition that Tracy had given in one of her custody cases, and again, in a police interview, the same type of description of this man. It would be strange if Dustin had that information or used the same phrasing, but somehow Tracy told Dustin she had a job for him that involved taking down this crazy dictation, basically telling this poor kid what to write. Then she pulled out a gun, pointed it at him, and started shooting. He never saw it coming. The last thing he saw was someone he thought was his friend taking his life. Smith called this an execution and also pointed out that it would be impossible for two men to have attacked Tracy while she was entering two codes into a locked gun safe, take out two separate guns, and shoot blindly over her shoulder. She shot Dustin, then went out to his car and planted a notebook for police to find, then went back inside and used the pantyhose to create marks on her neck. These marks were proven to be in the wrong position to have blocked her airway enough for her to ever lose consciousness. They were superficial and from friction. They would have long overpowered her before she managed any of those dramatic heroics. Bert was the defense's star witness. He testified on behalf of his mother. He even had an elaborate tattoo that depicted the harrowing home invasion incident. That tattoo prominently featured his mother, the hero, 
symbolizing her crucial role in saving this child's life. Wow. During this testimony, Bert emphatically stated that he knew without a doubt that he would have been dead if it wasn't for his mother's brave actions. Tracy was sobbing uncontrollably as Bert recounted the events of the home invasion. He walked the jurors through the terrifying ordeal step by step. But in his new version, he didn't stay in the room with his siblings. Instead, he claimed he opened the door several times. He heard Dustin's voice. He heard two men talking about killing his mom and remembered that Michael and Dustin were practicing home invasions when they shot paintballs. What's crazy is that as part of her defense, Tracy said that Michael had been talking in his sleep and that he would talk about things and she could answer him and that he admitted in his sleep that Dustin had this journal and that if people were to read it and find it, it would cover his ass. It was full of information about Dr. John Pittman. And that's how she knew about it. She knew about it because he was sleep talking. Wow. So despite the defense's claims that the home invasion was genuine and Tracy acted in self-defense when she shot Dustin, the jury reached a different conclusion. They found Tracy guilty of first-degree murder. We were able to listen to an interview with some of the men and women that were on that jury, and it was very interesting how invested they were in truly making sure they got this right. They were dealing with a mother and her protecting her children, so they wanted to get it right. They said that from the outset, the defense had the advantage. Tracy's story was so compelling. She was a mother trying to protect her household. And the jurors agreed that they would do the same thing if that was them. A mother's act of self-defense made a lot more sense at first than the prosecution's theory that Tracy was a bitter ex-wife who masterminded this whole plot to get back at her ex-husband, Dr. Pittman, and frame him for a murder so that she could win a custody case. But as they listened and analyzed the evidence for themselves, the jurors began to see that Tracy's version of events did not add up. First, the fact that she said that she shot one of the guns while shooting over her shoulder and managed to hit the assailant, she had to be quite an accurate shooter, especially with her wrists tied together. And that's a fact that came out at trial, actually. That was not a fact that was mentioned before. It was actually brought up by Bert. In his version, he said he untied his mother's hands that were tied with pantyhose. One juror could not get past the fact that Tracy had taken one of the guns downstairs and unloaded it on the kitchen counter. She thought, if you're protecting your children and there's someone on the loose, why would you unload the gun? You would keep it loaded. They even took the time to recreate that 18-inch space between the bed and the wall so that they could take turns acting out how Tracy claimed she had run over, opened the safe, grabbed the guns, and shot the assailant. Each juror took turns laying on their stomach, picking up the guns, and trying to pretend to fire them over their shoulder. And one woman juror that was close in size to Tracy could hardly hold the gun with one hand, and she could not even imagine the power of shooting it with only one hand over her shoulder, because these were Pretty heavy guns. And some of the other jurors agreed that the guns were bigger and heavier than they appeared when they were just looking at the evidence during the trial. They even tried to use that pair of pantyhose to recreate the marks on their necks. And sure enough, it wasn't hard at all to make it appear exactly the way Tracy's neck looked in those crime scene photos. It didn't take much on such soft skin on the neck to leave that red mark. And Dustin had no history of violence. It was quite the opposite. He was a gentle and quiet person. There were only four times his family could remember him ever becoming upset. He didn't fit the profile, not to mention he was unarmed. It just didn't add up. During the victim impact statements, Dustin's mother, Mona, and his two sisters had the opportunity to address the court. They expressed their deep sorrow over the loss of Dustin and emphasized how Tracy's actions had cheated him out of a future. However, they also expressed gratitude for the court's decision, which brought them a sense of justice and closure. Dustin's family would like the world to know that he was not a bad guy. Every day they miss him dearly. He was a great son and a loving big brother who didn't deserve this. His absence and his father's had made life incredibly challenging for his family. On December 5th, 2011, Tracy was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She continues to maintain her innocence and Bert, who changed his name to Bert Richter, taking his mother's last name, maintains a Facebook page dedicated to his mother's innocence. To date, Tracy has never taken any responsibility for her crimes. 
She has paranoid conspiracy theories that the prosecutor is actually friends with her ex-husband, Michael Roberts, and they manufactured evidence, they hacked into computers, and they set her up to be found guilty for Dustin's murder. There are also claims that Ben Smith is married to Mary Higgins' daughter. I was not sure about any of this. The one thing I found while looking into this is that after Tracy was convicted, she actually began writing a child S offender that was in the Wisconsin prison. And in one of these letters, she asked him to find out if his cellmate had information on the second man in the alleged home invasion. And the reason why is apparently because the cellmate had been watching Dateline. He was interested in the case. And she was saying, well, it would be great if he would come forward with information if he knows it. I'm sure God would bless him if he did. She needed new evidence to get a new trial. She was hoping that man would help her find someone to say that they were the second person with Dustin and had been hired by Michael. And in another letter, she sent him a photo of small children and said, aren't they cute? Yeah. In an additional letter, she included information that could be used to find Michael Roberts, including his social security number, his date of birth, and his physical description. And just so you know, he's under like witness protection. He's back in Australia now, but he did initially move to California and had the kids and that was a whole thing. But yeah, he has to be protected. Prosecutor Ben Smith told a local newspaper, quote, she's dangerous and everybody keeps underestimating her. I feared for Michael and his kids, end quote. After a long battle with Tracy from prison, Michael was eventually allowed to relocate to Australia with his children because at first the judge was saying that she could still have visitation with the children, even though she was in prison, but eventually he was able to move. Tracy's mother, Anna, Tracy's son, Bert, and some others close to Tracy have created numerous Facebook pages and websites to declare her innocence. We've taken our time to look through this information, and if you feel so inclined, I always say to look at everything so that you can make a decision on what you believe is true in these cases. I respect the judicial system and a jury of Tracy's peers heard all of the evidence and they decided that the state met their burden of proof. I don't argue with a verdict because I wasn't there. It's not my job. So in my perspective, this case is closed. However, we will leave the links below if you are interested in doing additional research into some of the theories that Tracy loved ones have set forward. And there are a lot of them and they are pretty interesting. And because her family was making all of these websites and making sure that her innocence was proclaimed, Tracy's mom actually ended up suing prosecutor Ben Smith because he brought charges against her for using a site called Ripoff Report. You may have heard of it. And she was intimidating witnesses, harassing them, anyone who was against Tracy. And this website was used to disparage and defame the reputation of people that were against her daughter. And she also did this to any witness that was on her ex-husband's sides as well. And in an exclusive interview Prosecutor Smith gave to 60 Minutes television show, he stated that the public doesn't even know half of what Tracy is capable of. And even behind bars, she still remains a danger to others. Tracy is still housed today at the Iowa Correctional Institution for Women. And to date, all of her appeals have been denied. In the end, it seems like Tracy Richter Pittman Roberts was an angry woman willing to do whatever it took to get what she wanted. There was no line she wouldn't cross and no one who wasn't expendable. She lied, stole, cheated, deceived, extorted, defamed, and eventually even murdered in her quest to seek revenge on anyone who got in her way. Thanks for joining us for the life and crimes of Tracy Richter Pittman Roberts. And please don't forget to like and subscribe and make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on what's next. We'll see you in our next episode. Bye. Bye.